Steve Sirfoss here, continuing uh, with this series of, series of videos and Bible, looking at passages of the Bible uh, on the subject of free will. And I think as we go along, it's getting more and more clear um, what I see in the Bible that I call free will. Um, we'll look at it in today's passage. And actually today, I want to go back to the book of Genesis. Uh, originally, we started out in Genesis chapter Three, uh, well, one, two, and three. Just looking at how um, the beautiful part of that passage there was that there was no sinful nature, there was no sin in man. So it kind of obligates us to go in and look at uh, you know what our philosophical and logical presuppositions are of whether God can, uh, it, whether man had free will at all to begin with, without sin, without sinful nature. Uh, if that messes up the sovereignty of God, or if God is such a big God as I believe that the Bible teaches that he can give man free will and he still knows what's going to happen. Um, and again, it's an, a real free will, but a limited free will. But anyway, you can go back to video number one if you want to the definition. Right now I want to read a beautiful passage from Genesis 4, and even though I want to really focus in on one verse, a very key verse here. Uh, I think the Word of God is something that we don't tear to bits and shreds just to prove a point. Let's uh, listen to what the story and as it's related what happened here in Genesis chapter 4 in verse 1. It says, Adam lay with his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wonder on earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain, so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence, and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Again, now we're right in the thick of things. Obviously, Cain is part of fallen humanity. I guess an argument could be made that uh, he has not sinned yet. Um, I don't know um, that you know that he was born before um, the fall. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, born before the fall and raised maybe before the fall. I mean, that argument could be made. We really don't know timing in the Bible um, that precise. Um, we know that uh, Adam and Eve, it's related, have uh, uh, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. Then they have another son after that who's named Seth. And we know that Seth was born when Adam was 130 years. So how we take those 130 years and distribute them, uh, you know, when Cain killed Abel and so on and so forth, and work our way backwards, uh, there's a lot of time there to go one way or the other. Uh, but I'm going to assume uh, right here, and that's an assumption. It's always bad to assume things. But I'm going to assume here that, that Cain um, is not the first time that he has sinned here, that he has already, when Adam and Eve fell, it went to all men, and he's subject to that. So without getting into argument of timeline, just going on the fact that Adam and Eve sinned and that went to all of mankind, um, he gets upset. He gets upset, actually, uh, because of something that God did. 
God accepted Abel's sacrifice and didn't like his sacrifice. What I want to look at is in verse 6, what God told him. And I want you to look at, is this God coming out and saying, Cain, got bad news for you, buddy. You're not predestined to be good, so you know, go ahead and do whatever you want to. It doesn't matter. You're predestined for this. You're predestined for destruction. Now, God knew what was going to happen. God knew the final result. But that's not our part of the equation. We are not gods. We're not supposed to act like gods to our fellow human beings. Uh, we are pretty much in the position that Cain was before God. And look what God tells him again. Cain, a fallen man after sin. Man is un subject to, and, and uh, well, we're going to read it here in the passage more than what I can say. And the Lord, verse 6, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are, your ang why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Now that's a pretty good idea that he already has sin in his heart and in his life. But look at verse 7. He says, If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Okay? God is saying, What are you going to do? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? And all this, of course, is in the context of offering an offering to God that God would find acceptable. So he says, If you do what is right, will you not be acceptable? Then he gives them the other side of the equation. And as I pointed out, my definition of free will, free will is option A or option B. And when I get to pick between option A and option B, and option A has certain consequences, and option B has certain consequences, and I get to make the, the, the decision, again, I'm not, uh, only thing I'm, the only reason I'm saying he gets to make the decision here is because God is telling him that in Scripture. I'm not coming through with you know, some theology and reading that into Scripture. He's saying, but if you do not do what is right, Sin is crouching at your door. So God's telling him, option number one, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. And it is very interesting to what God tells him, this early part of Genesis here. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. So here we see sin is more than just a thing that I do in disobedience to God. It's a power. It's a slavery, as, as Paul points out in the book of Romans. Sin desires to have you, but what does God tell him? What is he telling uh, Cain to do? Whose side is Cain on? Uh, I mean, is God on? Is God on Cain's side, or is God against Cain? God says, but you must master it. Now, I don't see how that verse... Um, in verse 7 makes any sense. Uh, either God's pulling everybody's leg, um, or, or Cain's leg, or God is talking to a man who has free will choices. Now that, from what I understand of Scripture, does not rule out since God is all-knowing that he, he knew what was going to happen. And of course we read in the book of Hebrews that Abel was the first martyr. As we go on, we see that he made his decision. He took, Cain, uh, he took Abel out and he killed him. And, uh, and then uh, it's kind of, you know, ironic to see him, uh, well, God comes in and he says, okay, I gave you a choice. I mean, he does not say the word choice, for those of you who are real uh, penny, you know, nitpicking on, on the words here, but he says, you can do good or you can do what's not good. You do right, you'll be accepted. If you do what's wrong, then uh, sin's going to take hold of you, you know, and, and he wants to have you. He wants to have master over you. Um, and so then God comes to him. The Lord says, what have you done? Now, obviously, we know that God knew what he had done. This is where we see God does not give his uh, all what he knows and what he's predestined, what he knows is going to happen in the future. He doesn't reveal that to us precisely so that he can let us work and, and get the consequences and think about what we've done and so forth. He knows what he's done. He doesn't know what have you done. It's not that he doesn't know. He knows. Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. So God gives him, God has gave him a choice and God is faithful in giving him the consequences. Again, obviously with this free will he doesn't save himself, he goes into sin, but God is telling him, hey you have a choice and he's holding him responsible for the choice that he made in this case. Uh, two things in closing, uh, it's interesting that he complains about the punishment it's also interesting that in the midst of even punishing him, God shows a certain degree of mercy to him. But I'll let you read the text to get that out of it. God bless you.